As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today we have a returning guest, renowned author and speaker and writer, G. Edward Griffin, known for his expose of the foundation of the Federal Reserve, the creature from Jekyll Island, is back here with us in Reluctant Preppers. Thank you for returning to visit us, Mr. Griffin. Well, thank you for inviting me. Given that we're in the mid, the throes of the presidential election season here in the United States, it's almost inescapable. Everywhere we turn, we're, we're inundated with uh, talk about and sound bites and posturing and all kinds of uh, stagemanship and, and being told what the candidates stand for and uh, what choices we have. But in this channel, we're really about awareness and preparedness and really wanting people to be more informed uh, so that they know uh, what they're being consenting to if they're going to be participating in uh, and selecting from in this contest. But in doing so, uh, I wanted to know if we could first look at a little bit of a fundamental question about the the very purpose and role of government from your from your website. Uh, you're also founder of freedomforceinternational.org and on there there's an article about collectivism versus individualism and I thought if we could use that to, as a springboard to really sort of set some unchanging groundwork in place and then apply it to the contemporary political situation we find ourselves in today, if that uh, works for you. Well, Duncan, that works very well for me, and I'm delighted to hear you grapple with that aspect of the situation because I, I, I believe that people get so uh, wrapped up with little details of who said what and what's going on where and how many people are involved and how many people got killed and, you know, the numbers and the details and the data that they tend to overlook the fundamental principles and the, and the overall ideas that are driving all of this current history. So, yeah, I'm delighted to talk about that. And, and, and uh, I'd like to say that anybody that thinks that this is going to be a philosophical or ideological discussion, uh, they're correct. But if they think it's going to be boring, I don't think so, because <laughs> that's where the excitement all starts. Yeah, there was a class in my high school that was ahead of its time called Isms, where they talked about all these infamous or famous uh, schools of thought, uh, including uh, socialism, communism, etc. And uh, I, in reading your article about collectivism versus individualism, you mentioned in there a study of collectivist literature from leading fascists, communists, and socialists reveal certain recurring themes that may be considered as the seven pillars of collectivism, and if these values are represented are reversed, they become the seven pillars of individualism. So would you explain to us, so that we can recognize them when we see them played out in our modern world, uh, what are the seven pillars of collectivism as you, as you describe them? Yeah, that cuts right to the core of the issue. I'd like to start by saying that uh, my interest in this goes back to the early 19. 60s. At that time, I began to take an interest in, in the bigger world around me. Prior to that, I was just a young fellow, a newly married, had a couple of kids, and I wanted to uh, get into the corporate world and climb the ladder and, you know, build a successful uh, nest for the family and uh, a nest egg for retirement, all the usual things. And then I began to take an interest in the bigger picture, what was going on in the world and what affected our futures in terms of freedom and security and so forth. And I kind of got off that corporate track, and I'm happy to say I did. But in that process, and the reason I'm telling this story is that uh, I started to hang out in the, uh, in the communist bookstore in Los Angeles, not because I was really uh, interested in communism per se or that I was attracted to it, but because I was curious about it. There was a – remember, this is 1960, 1961, 62. And um, there was a lot of um, concern at that time about the growth of communism, and rightly so, I think, although I don't think people had a really good grasp of what it was. And so anyway, I was curious. And the point is I went down to this 
place. It's called the People's Bookshop <laughs> down on Mark, uh, at Larchmont Street in Los Angeles near downtown. And I was hanging out with some of the comrades down there, and I, I bought a lot of their books, and <clears throat> I even attended a couple of their study uh, groups. Um, and, they, they, you know, they thought they had a real live recruit on their hands. They were trying to recruit me. And uh, I just went along with the game. I said, yeah. I said, what are you guys talking about? And I read their books. In fact, I think I, I wound up reading more of their books than some of them themselves did. So I, I, the reason I'm telling you this is because I, I've read – in those days, I read the works of, of uh, Karl Marx, you know, Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto. And I read the, uh, the works of um, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and the voluminous works of Joseph Stalin – and I moved across, and I was reading the works of Mao Zedong, and and um, and then I started to read the stuff put out by the so-called right wing, the Nazis. I read Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, and I read the speeches and papers published by uh, Benito Mussolini, and I began to notice that even though these people, the right and the left, the communists and the Nazis, supposedly were against each other, and they were supposedly enemies of each other, I noticed that they were basically saying the same thing. Their ideology was the same. And I noticed certain recurring patterns and issues that came up, and I started to take notes. And that that awareness and discovery lasted, for me at least, it took me a long time, but over a period of maybe 10 years, uh, exploring all of this literature, I, I created a list of actually nine different um, uh, categories that uh, or issues that were identical to all collectivist movements. And I call it collectivism because that's really what it is. If you peel off the label of, you know, Nazism, fascism, socialism, communism, and all these isms that you studied, uh, and you look at the, the components of the belief structure underneath, you find that they are the same. So I, I made a list of them, and there were nine of them approximately. And I also began to realize at that time that there were, a cons there were constructive ar opposite arguments and positions in each of these. And I soon discovered that there was a name for both of these groups. On the one side, with all of these isms that were the same, they were merely variants of something called collectivism. And on the other side, the constructive opposites on each point were something that I had never heard of before – at that time, and that's called individualism. Now, these words sound strange to the ear today, but I've discovered that uh, um, 80 years, 100 years, 150 years ago, the literature was loaded with those words. Everybody used them, and they understood what they meant, but it, only in more recent modern times did those words fall into disuse and became replaced by all these uh, variants, such as you know, socialism, communism, fascism, liberalism and all that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, that's a little background as to how I got into this. And, and uh, I, I'm really pleased that you're interested in these uh, seven major uh, differences or categories that are common to all collectivist thoughts. And then the two extra that I add on, which maybe aren't so important, but they are nevertheless found in all collectivist uh, literature. So here we go, and I'll try not to take, be too winded on this, but the first one is the, the nature or the source of human rights. And where, do, where do human rights come from? And you'll find that all collectivists say that the rights of mankind are granted by the state, period. And uh, the United Nations, for example, is very clear on this. They have a document – called the Draft Covenant on Human Rights. And they spell it out in plain language. They say, these rights granted by the state to the individuals uh, are very valuable and sacred and all that sort of thing. And um, on the other side, the individual says, no, no, rights are not granted by the state because if the state has the power to grant rights, it also has the power to take them away. If it's this, yeah, and it's as simple as that. And so the individualist says, no, no, these rights come with the individual himself. We're born with these rights. Some people will say they're God-given rights. Others will say, well, I don't know about that, but I sure know that when I'm born, I want these rights. They should be mine. And if you recall in the Declaration 
of independence of the United States, it says in plain language that it is the purpose of the state to protect the lives, liberty, and property of the citizens, to protect the human rights. It wasn't to grant them. It was to protect them. And so there, therein lies the, the uh, difference, a major difference, uh, between collectivism and individualism is in the origin of human rights. And it's a profound difference because um, – there's another document that's published by the United Nations, and it's more like a textbook than anything else. And it teaches uh, bureaucrats, literally, uh, or public servants, if you want to call them that, uh, how to draft laws to take away human rights. Believe it or not, that's exactly what it is. You see, if the state can grant rights, it can also take them away. All you have to do is pass a law. And you find this well spelled out in the old um, – Constitution of the Soviet Union. That's one of those books I read, by the way, when I was hanging out down there at the People's Bookshop. Constitution of the old Soviet Union had a whole bunch of very nice rights listed. It said, you know, people have a right to job, a right to uh, peaceful assembly, have a right to, to, um, to travel, all of these things. Guaranteed in the Constitution of the Soviet Union, but nobody in the Soviet Union actually had those rights, <laughs> even though they were guaranteed. And how can that be? Because when you – if you had read this the, – I still have a copy of it. It's a cherished copy in my library. It says, for example, it says, every man has a right to freedom of speech except – there's the word – except as may be provided for by law. Wow. Wow. That is exactly the same language, by the way, you find in the United Nations draft covenant on human rights. All of these rights are guaranteed except – as may be provided for by law, which simply means that the state grants you a right, and then if it wants to take it away, all it has to do is just get together and raise hands and vote on it, and they pass a law, and you don't have that right anymore. And it's as simple as that. And people don't understand this critical difference. So there's, I could talk more on that, but I think you got the idea. In telling that story, you brought me back to, uh, right back to uh, when I was, I was walking home from high school with a new uh, member of our class uh, who had just moved there with his family, immigrated from Russia, and I was striking up a conversation with him. His English was was better than my Russian, but uh, I didn't speak any of it, but uh, he was just learning uh, English uh, uh, better, but as I I said, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? We we agreed we both like to go fishing. We, we like to work on cars. We had some common interests. I was willing to learn to play chess. But then when the conversation, I said, so what do you think about? I started mentioning some large political figures in uh, Russia at the time, and he clammed right up and he said rather uh, uncomfortably, said, we don't talk about politics, and. I just there was just this chill that came between us, and we were, we had been striking up this warm friendship, and we continued to become best best of friends for the years after that. But um, I realized that he was coming with a very different expectation than I was about the the freedom to uh, speak your mind and dis discuss things, because he was concerned about being potentially reported by someone who he might strike up a conversation with if he was interpreted as coming off critical of the government. Yeah, exactly. And we see uh, that exact situation beginning to develop here in the United States today. But And that's because uh, our own system has evolved away from the concept that human rights are intrinsic to the individual. That they're, you know, our system traditionally said that rights are hardware, not software. And it's not added later on. It comes right with, with the human being. And, of course, the collectivist says, no, no, no. Human rights are software, and these are granted by the state. So there's just one element. And you, you can dwell on that in your mind and think of all the ramifications that that uh, has uh, for the kind of a system we want to live under. And I think anybody that gives it a lot of thought quickly comes to the conclusion that they would rather live in a system in which human rights are intrinsic to the individual and not granted by the state. So we move on to the next one. I noticed that it was – and this is very profound too. They all are. It's the supremacy of the individual over the group. Now, that it means what is the most important element of society? Is it the group or the individual? Well, the collectivist says that's easy. It's the group. The group is more important than the individual because the individual must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. Now, 
That's the philosophy. I was taught that in school, and at the time, it sounded very reasonable. After all, isn't that the basis of democracy, you know? Well, we might have more to say on that, too, but uh, there's another one of those words that needs to be defined. But the idea that the group is more important than the individual is common to all uh, varieties of collectivism. And it's under that banner that some of the greatest atrocities can be committed because no matter how bad it is, you can always say, well, it was too bad, but, you know, we had to, we had to uh, do this in order to serve the best interest of the people or society or something like that or the state, the survival of the state, you know. And uh, so I, I, had, I had a little trouble with that one because I did buy that in school. I thought that made a lot of sense. And then I got to thinking, wait a minute. This thing, the group, what is group? And then it dawned on me, group does not exist. It's not real. There is no such thing as a group. There are only individuals. You cannot see a group. You cannot touch a group. You can see in the, a lot of individuals. You can touch individuals. But this word group is an abstraction in the mind. It's a mathematical concept. It's not real. It's not tangible. It's not physical. Just like the word forest. What is a forest? You cannot see a forest. You cannot touch a forest. But you can see trees and touch trees, but not a forest. And then it's, it became very clear to me. If we take an abstraction that doesn't really exist and say that that abstraction is more important than the individual which does exist and is real, we made a huge, huge mistake because then there will be demagogues who will come along and say, I or we, the party, but usually it's I, speak for the group. I will uh, tell you what is best for the group. And anything I say is in the interest of the group and therefore you will follow my dictates, not because I'm a dictator, but because I represent the people. And, you know, that's how it works. That's the trick. And a lot of people fall for it, including myself when I was a young fellow in school. And then I got to think, oh, my gosh, this is a serious mistake. Uh, you know, t t t it all comes back to the word democracy in a way because we've been taught that democracy is the ideal form of government. Well, our founding fathers didn't think so. And, and when they wrote about it, they said so in plain language. They said that a democracy is one of the worst forms of government and we better not have one. And they said so. That's why you won't find the word democracy in our constitution or a declaration of independence. But you will find the word republic. Now, those words don't mean today what they used to, but in those days, the word republic had a very definite meaning, and it merely meet, meant that it was a democratic system, but there were limitations to the majority rule. And that's an important additional concept. The majority should rule, yes, but up to the point where it would violate the rights of the individual, because the individual is the only thing that's real. Take, example, for example, a lynch mob. Well, that's clear. There's only one dissenting vote, and he's at the end of the rope. So, uh, you know, if you're going to say pure democracy is fine, then you've got to endorse lynch mobs or any other kind of mob action that takes place. And it doesn't take, you know, long to realize that, wait a minute, that's not the answer at all. So we come back to this more mature uh, evaluation that, yeah, nothing wrong uh, with majority opinion and majority rights and so forth uh, as a mathematical concept. But when it comes to placing the rights of this group, which doesn't exist, uh, so high that it overrides the rights of individuals, which do exist, uh, you're on the wrong track. And you've set up a system in which demagogues, once again, can, uh, can rule and tell you that it's really in the best interest of you. So there you have another very important thing. Uh, you know, the American Constitution uh, says that, you know, the, the Bill of Rights in the beginning, and what does that mean? The Bill of Rights is, is an example of this philosophy. It's not, it's really a, not a, a Bill of Rights at all. It's a Bill of Thou Shalt Nots. It's saying the government, meaning the people, meaning the majority, 
the majority shall not pass any law restricting the rights of the individual's freedom of speech, peaceful assembly, right to bear arms, and so forth. It's not granting rights. It's restricting the government from denying rights. And that's a very important concept. Interestingly, that for those who are uh, people of faith, uh, hearing this, it echoes the uh, recognition of the inherent worth of the individual person as inviolable. And it flies in the face of utilitarianism, which is often practiced by uh, fascist or or absolutist uh, dictators thinking that whatever, as you said, it seems appealing at first when you say, well, the good of the many outweighs the good of the one or the two. But that can justify, as you mentioned, any kind of atrocity, because unless there are inviolable rights of personhood inherent to be being a person intrinsic, um, then you can justify uh, just about anything and has been happening, you know, throughout history. Yeah, that is the biggest, the biggest crimes of history are done in the name of the group. And it's as simple as that. Ironically, when people talk about people being imprisoned by uh, religious belief, uh, one of the first uh, actions sometimes in these uh, totalitarian regimes, as we saw with book burning in, in Nazi Germany or whatever, is to is to strike out against uh, the church or uh, burning a, a religious or, or faith-filled education, that sort of thing, because it's something that reminds people of their uh, inherent dignity of their personhood and that the, the state wants to obliterate that, that memory and that knowledge of theirs so that it can take over in the place of the one who really grants the rights. Exactly, exactly. And so you come at the end of all of this process, you come to the conclusion, amazing conclusion, that the greater good of the greater number is really achieved by recognizing the superior value of the individual. And that is just a, it's a mind blower because uh, we've been taught, you know, the greater good is served by serving the group. And now we, we really have to conclude that serving the individual's or not serving, but protecting the rights of the individual does produce the greatest good for the greatest number. So anyway, that's number two. And we're, we're moving slowly on this, so I think I should speed up a bit. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I don't, we don't have all day. <laughs> I'm delighted you asked me to talk about these because that's my favorite topic. Um, we come to something under the heading of freedom of choice. Collectivists do not trust Freedom. They don't think people are capable of um, dealing with freedom. They're convinced that free people will make bad choices. <laughs> and only they know what the good choices are. So therefore, they should be in charge of society to tell us what to do for our own good, you see. Whereas individualists believe that individuals will make the best choices. Not that they will always make the right choices, but at least they should be free to make their own choices, good or bad. And, you know, the, the, uh, the idea is perhaps best uh, uh, explained by seatbelt laws. Uh, now here, the collectivist says, now, uh, seatbelts are a good thing. You should put your seatbelt on because if you don't, if you have an accident, you could you get, be damaged or even be killed. So, by golly, uh, we should pass a law and have force everybody to wear seatbelts. And if you don't, by golly, we're going to put you in prison. <laughs> I have a friend, by the way, a good friend. And he, he and I don't see eye to eye on this at all. But one of the things about him is he gets irate so easily at, at outrages that, uh, well, they should outrage you. But if he sees somebody throwing a cigarette butt on the ground, what does he say? He says, ah, there ought to be a law, you know. <laughs> yeah. If somebody makes too much noise uh, in, in, a, in a restaurant, he says, ah, there ought to be a law. You know, the idea, if anything upsets him or if he sees anything that he doesn't think is right, regardless of whether his evaluation is correct or not, he thinks that people ought to be coerced by law, physical force, to do what is right because otherwise they are not smart enough or good enough to make the right decisions. Okay, that's the collectivist mentality. The individualist says, no, no, I, I agree too that seat belts are a good thing. Yeah, I know that you can have accidents and, and hurt yourself or even be killed without a seatbelt. But I don't believe I should put you in prison or fine you heavily if you don't put on your seatbelt. I believe that you should have freedom to choose. And therefore, I, the only way I'm going to have freedom to choose is to give it to you also. The individualist says, I believe that I should uh, perhaps 
donate some money to an educational campaign so that we can educate everybody to the value of seatbelts. I believe that I should especially show by good example that you should wear seatbelts. Every time I get in the car, I will put my seatbelt on, but I'm not going to throw you in prison if you choose not to do that. This is a very important distinction. You see it all over the place. Anytime an individualist, um, anytime a collectivist thinks that something ought to be done, his immediate thought is there ought to be a law, so we need to force people by uh, threat of imprisonment or heavy fine to do so. So there's another important uh, difference, and it's because of the accumulation of thousands upon thousands of little laws that we think, well, this is a good idea. We'll pass this law. We'll pass that one. And then we wonder at the end of 100 years, what happened to our freedom? You know, it's because we voluntarily gave them away little bit by bit because we thought that something was to be attained that was good. And we didn't want to give people the freedom to choose whether it was good or not. Well, okay, you could talk more about that, but let's move on to the next one. Property rights. Now, they're all, uh, you find all collectivist systems um, believe very strongly that property should not be owned by human beings. They, they say that humans cannot, should not, must not own property. And uh, it seems like a strange position because, you know, uh, we all have an instinct for ownership. It's, it comes with us. It's genetically encoded into us. There's a, there's a great little book I read not too long ago. Well, not so little. It's called The Territorial Imperative. I urge everybody to read it. It, it just is a, uh, an analysis of all the species that are known to man. Uh, the major species, all of them have this, this instinct for ownership of of property. It's uh, closely tied with the mating instinct, actually, uh, but it's, it's part of our, our uh, nature, and it actually it has some, uh, some good aspects to it. I mean, it's not just greed. Uh, it's just the opposite. As a matter of fact, we know that when we give property um, that is not owned and we let others, others use it, uh, but they don't own it. They're not responsible for it. They don't, you know, they, they're not responsible for its maintenance. Um, they will ab- quite often they'll abuse the property. Uh, just take a look at uh, state-owned housing, for example, where pe- where people move into facilities, very nice facilities, but they didn't pay for it. They didn't have to work for it. It's just given to them because they're poor people and they deserve a break or whatever the rationale is. And within a year, the property is trashed. But you just could go down the street and there's a little house on the other side of the street that somebody worked hard for. It's all painted. The grass is cut and everything because it's their property. And so this, this right to own property actually rewards those who are good stewards of property. And it punishes those who are not. So it has some very positive advantages too. But the most important advantage is that Ownership of property is the only way that an individual can become independent, uh, independent of others for his own survival. If we don't have property, we must depend on others for our food, our shelter, our clothing. And sometimes that's necessary. That's the value of the family or the value of the church or some other grouping that we voluntarily enter into is to help those in need. But if it's a systemic thing and there is no group that you can go to and you, you don't have food because you can't own food, uh, you, can't, you, don't have, you don't own your house, you're, you're taking whatever is assigned to you by the state. In other words, if you're dependent on the state, then the state tells you what to do. And so if you want to be free, you must endorse the principle of private property. And that is the reason that all collectivist systems are enemies of private property. They, there is no exception. They all want to make sure that pe- people do not have the right to own property. You just connected the dots for me on something. We've had several guests here on our program talk about the difference between real money, such as gold and silver, or the increasingly intangible, uh, what used to be paper currency or, or false coins that we were given, but then even now just becoming electronic transactions and that sort of thing, where you can't own it. 
uh, it's it's outside of your control. It, it's outside of your hands. It's it's turned on or turned off at the whim of of some power that be. But it's it's completely taking away the ability to to really own money. Well, there you have it. Money is property, is it not? It's merely a form of property that you can you can um, exchange for other forms of property. But it's property. So obviously, if you don't have the right to have money, you have no access to anything except being in the good graces of those who do. It makes you a slave. And that's, that's the heart of the issue right there. So, well, anyway, uh, then we go on to the next one, uh, which is money itself, uh, money without coercion. You know, uh, that's one of the things that uh, all collectivist systems have uh, in, their, in their platform, is that the money system should be owned and operated by the state, which means them. The people who are the leaders and uh, the controllers of the state, um, for the very reason that you mentioned just a moment ago, which is that uh, if you if you don't have freedom to choose money and you have to you take whatever the state says you must take, and that's the that's the reality of the world in which we live today, is a result of uh, what they call legal tender laws, which simply are laws that require you to accept the money issued by your government, and if you don't accept it, well then you go to prison. Now, if you had an honest money was based, by, based on something of intrinsic value, like gold or silver or anything else that took human effort to produce, you wouldn't have to force anybody to accept it. They'd be glad to accept it. It's only when you are forced to accept uh, you know, pieces of paper or digital impulses in a computer uh, that you might be thinking, gee, I'd like to use something else as money. And if you had the freedom to do that, well, then all of a sudden, the collectivist state would no longer have power over you. Uh, you would be independent. And so every collectivist system requires that people accept its fiat money, whether they like it or not. Collectivists uh, insist on it. Individualists say no. Uh, everybody should have the freedom to accept or reject anything they choose as money. Very important, uh, very important distinction. And then there's something called equality under law. I noticed that this was common to all of the collectivist systems that I studied. Um, we, everybody says, well, we want equality under law. We want everybody to be equal under the law. But if you look at the laws that are being passed today, I'm pretty confident that over 99% of them violate that principle. In fact, the primary purpose of most of the laws being written today are to Treat individual classes or groups of citizens unequally. It's to redistribute wealth or privilege or power. It's to give one group an advantage that the other group does not have. I mean, just take a look at the laws and 99.9% .9 of them violate that principle of equality under law. And nobody stops to think about it. So individualists believe that we really mean it when we say every group should be treated the same under law, regardless of their national origin, their race, religion, their gender, their education, their economic status, their lifestyle, or political opinion even. And, you know, no class should be given preferential treatment, regardless of the assumed merit or popularity of its cause, because to favor one class over another is not equality under law. And then we come to the last one, or the last of the seven anyway, which is the proper function of the state. What is the proper function of the state? Fundamental question. Nobody ever asks that. They just assume the state can do anything it wishes. As long as you can get 51% of the vote, then bingo, you can do it. That's democracy. And we're back to the lynch mob uh, illustration again. And that is not the way we want it. Um, the proper function of the state uh, according to collectivists, is unlimited. It can do anything that the majority wants. The proper function of the state, according to the individualist, is that it is extremely limited. And it's, the nature of its limitation is well-defined. It's not just that vague statement that we should have limited government. We have to go one step further and say, how much limited? Define what that word means. Let's be specific. And it always comes to this. The purpose or the honest, legitimate purpose of the state is to do only those things which the people themselves can do. 
In other words, where does the state get its its uh, lawful or its uh, logical power? If we assume that the state is the servant of the people and it gets this authority from the people, which is the concept that we believe in, then it follows that the state can only do those things which the people themselves can do. In other words, how can you give to the state an authority which you yourself do not have? So we have to look then very carefully at what is it that the people themselves can do that justifies the use of coercion and force. Because the state is nothing more or less than the legalized use of force even lethal force if necessary. So what are people logically allowed and, and supported by everyone to do, to use legal force? What are we justified to do that gives us the power and the, and the right to coerce our fellow human beings and even kill if necessary? And boy, when we put that test to it, it narrows it considerably, doesn't it? It, nar it narrows it down to this. We have the right to use lethal force against our neighbor only in self-defense. It's in self-defense. And in the defense of what? Defense of the life, liberty, and property of human beings. That's it. You cannot go beyond that. The minute you take one little baby step beyond that, you're on the slippery slope that opens it to anything at all. But if, if, if we have to use lethal force to defend our lives, our liberty, and our, or our property – Nobody would really say we did the wrong thing as, as uh, much as we would hate to do it. Still, we would be justified and most of, our, most of our friends would say, yep, that's true. It's tragic, but yes, you had a right to defend yourself. That does not mean that we have a right to uh, look at our neighbor next door and say, hey, I don't like the way you're educating your child. I think you, your child should be educated this way, not that way. We can't say, wait a minute, we don't want you to open your store on Sunday because that's that's the day of rest. It says so in the Bible. And we want to pass a law that you can't open your store on Sunday. We can't do that as individuals. How can we then authorize elected representatives to pass laws to use lethal force against people for, you know, doing what we think they should not do? So if we keep this in mind that the proper function of the use of lethal force or any kind of force is always defensive of life, liberty, and property, then that automatically transfers to the fact that that is the legitimate sphere of the state and nothing more. The state, in other words, instead of calling it government, let's call it a protectorate. It's not there to govern us. It's there to protect us. And so – and the proper function of the state – is to protect our lives, our liberty, and our property, and nothing more. Once we understand that, then I would say that most of the problems that we're facing in the political arena in the world today would, would evaporate very quickly. Now, those are the seven. I found all of those elements common to all of the collectivist systems that I studied. I've never found any exceptions to this day. And there are two more, which perhaps are not as important, but they're always present. One of them is this element of loyalty to some other group. Uh, collectivists do not, uh, do not tolerate any loyalty to anything but the state. They want the state to replace uh, religion and the family. As long as people can turn to their religion, to the religious leaders, to their families for support, uh, they will not be dependent upon or subservient to the state. And therefore, collectivist systems always are enemies of any concept that will diffuse loyalty away from the state. Therefore, they will not want people to belong to religions. They will not uh, want people to depend upon families. And so you find in the collectivist literature, without exception, that they are enemies of religion and the family unit. And that, that's the reason for that. It's a very logical reason from their point of view. And, and then the final element that you find in all collectivist systems is the concept of the great all-powerful leader. I mean, it's so uh, exemplified by Big Brother in uh, Orwell's 1984. I mean, we have it uh, in our own country in the last um, 50 years. The role of the president of the United States has grown way out of proportion to what it was to be originally. Originally, the president was merely a an employee uh, of the Senate, you know, the Senate selected the uh, the president to be an executive, kind of like uh, a board of directors would appoint a president of a corporation. 
sure, the president is important, but the president is not the, the king of a corporation. The president is obedient to the board of directors. He can be replaced by the board of directors and all of that sort of thing. Sometimes they can be elected, but the president is a servant, not a leader in, in the corporation. And that's the way it was originally in the United States. Now, ever since the period of Andrew Jackson, who I admire, by the way, because of his uh, battle against the, uh, the central bank. But with the beginning of Andrew Jackson's um, administration, the presidency began to take on the imperial power, and it became more and more like, uh, uh, like the kings of Europe. And we've seen that trend from that point forward grow and grow to the point where now we look at a president as though they're our own royalty, and they can do whatever they please. And, well, that's not the proper function of the state. So... Uh, we get back to the, the idea that all systems, all collectivist systems must have some kind of a great leader who stands up and puffs his chest out and says, trust me, I am your leader, I am your friend, I am your big brother, I am your God, and you follow me in my directions, and I will see that you live forever in this heaven, this utopian system of collectivism. So there you have it. I found that those were nine qualities that uh, appeared over and over again in all the collectivist um, literature that I was exposed to. And I think once we focus on these nine differences, and especially the first seven, we can clarify our own political ideology. Because in all cases, I think it's easy to make a choice. But we have to think about it and analyze the pros and the cons in each case. But once we've made that choice, it's, it's something that um, doesn't go away. And it's like you cannot unring the bell. Once you realize that these principles are at work in our daily lives, it'll change us forever. We can never be fooled again by demagogues who don't want us to think or know about these things. And with that background, if we turn that perspective then towards the contemporary political scene, we're in the throes of this election year in the United States. We're presented with what are supposedly a, a, a wide variety of candidates that we from from whom we can select our our uh, future president uh, and who, who should be getting our support because we, we really agree with their principles, their policies, their, their approach, that sort of thing. But in your article about collectivism, you made a rather startling conclusion that you said to this point that a lot of these uh, utopian fascist governments that, that people would, we, we've been taught to think are wrongheaded as far as communism, uh, totalitarianism, fascism, Nazism, uh, even socialism until about the last year was considered a, a naughty word for most people in the U.S., but you draw even a, a stronger insight on that uh, regarding our our so-called political right and political left, conservative versus liberal, Republican and Democrat, and if you can, you can spell that for us, uh, spell that out for us, that'd be helpful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very simple. When you look at all of these words, uh, left versus right, Republican versus Democrats, and liberals versus conservatives, and Nazis versus communists, and capitalists versus socialists, uh, on and on and on. Now we have neoconservatives, and just they're always throwing new words at us. They mean very little, if anything, because if you peel off their labels and look underneath those labels, you find these seven or nine elements that we've been discussing. They're all there in every one of them. And so you come to the conclusion that's in substance, in ideology, there is no difference between any of them. But they want us to think there is a difference. I came to the conclusion long ago that this, the so-called right wing and the so-called left wing are merely two opposite wings on the same ugly bird, which is called collectivism. And once we get hold of that reality, we'll stop being suckers in this political game. You know, they, they bang us back and forth between the Republican and the Democrat Party, and we think we're participating in our own political destiny. But you've noticed no, no matter which party is in office, without exception, for the last hundred years, hundred years, I say, there has been no substantial change in the basic direction of the philosophy of our government. Nor the size of the government, nor the size of the debt. Yeah, it's all collectivist. It's all collectivist and growing more and more so every day. There's no disagreement between either parties on that. Now, it's true that the Republican Party candidates have mastered the technique 
of talking a good line. They talk about limited government. They talk about living up to the Constitution. But you notice once they're elected, they don't do either of those things. It's just talk. It's just uh, rhetoric. It's just to get our votes. If we stop listening to what they say and watching what they do, we won't fall for this game anymore. Among the options that are open to people then, uh, we had actually a uh, activist farmer on our channel less than a month ago who talks about you can go into the the huge mega store supermarkets now and you you see these unending aisles packed with from floor to ceiling with these endless variety bewildering dizzying variety of products and yet if you pick them up and look on the ingredient labels you're going to find high fructose corn syrup soy and less than all these different same ingredients are, are in, you know, so many of the products here. There's, he's, he called it, we're, we're starving for real nutrition in the apparent of abundance. There's really scarcity. And so when we look at the, at the breadth of candidates that we're faced with in, in, to choose between in this political process, it can seem that there's a bewildering ab- abundance of choices. But are we hearing you correctly and saying, yes, but they're all, they're all branches from the same stem. They're all growing from the same vine. That is exactly what I'm saying. And I liked your analogy because you do find the same ingredients in most of the food. And in fact, you pick up competing brands and if you read the fine print in the back, you find they're all divisions of the same parent company. So that's what's happening in the world and that's certainly happening in the field of of politics. Mm -hmm. Or media. That's another thing. That's why we're here is to provide an alternate voice. And so that people can get a different, because when they turn on the corporate media, uh, you're just subject to that same that same um, message that's all uh, prepared to elicit the response of you cooperating with the system. So, what is the thinking person to do? What is a person who is awakening to and has made a determination in the fiber of their being that they are going to start learning how to stand up for their true uh, individuality, their true uh, independence? Uh, to to uh, really uh, look after the risks to their family and make sure that they're taking care of business. What can an individual actually do that makes that makes sense uh, given everything that we've talked about? Yes, I'm. I think that's an excellent uh, theme to close on because uh, after having said all of these things. Uh, your listeners may be surprised to know that I am not really pessimistic about the future. I really believe uh, that we are going to turn this thing around. And the reason that I believe it is because we have already started. Uh, In uh, 2002, uh, we created an organization called Freedom Force International. And it's a group, as it suggests, international in scope. We now have members in about 78 different countries. All of these countries around the world have the same basic problem, which is the growth of collectivism and um, the strangulation of any individualism that may have existed in those countries previously. And we know how to reverse this trend. We're going to reverse it in exactly the same way we lost it, which was not through force of arms, was not through violent revolutions, although there were some, some elements of that along the way. We lost it to collectivists because those people belong to groups and organizations that understood that the way to control society was to control the power centers of society. Quietly, uh, without much fanfare, they decided to move into those organizations, into the leadership positions, and without attracting a lot of attention, uh, deliberately try to bring about a change in society in which people were trained to accept collectivism to prefer collectivism and to reject individualism. This has been going on now for about a hundred years in terms of a determined uh, effect, a, a determined organizational program, a strategy and tactics. Yes, it has been going on. This is not conspiracy theory, by the way. This is just a matter of, of history. And we have all the, the documentation, the speeches, the books, the textbooks in some cases of these groups. And anybody that wants to study the tactic that was used to take over America and other countries around the world, you'll find it on our website, which is uh, put out by Freedom Force International. And uh, we believe that we can use a similar strategy as long as we do not adopt the same unethical um, standards of our opponent. We don't have to do that, but we do have to know that we We need to become active in the power centers of society, which means political parties in particular, means church organizations, labor groups, media centers, universities, colleges, you know, 
all these are all power centers that have fallen into the hands of collectivists who deliberately set out to accomplish the mission of changing the world. And education and entertainment, don't forget those. Oh, no, it's all there. And that is the way that we are going to reverse it. And the process has already begun. So if anybody really wants to know about this big story, and this is big, of how this is not only theorized, but it's actually happening right now, I urge you to come to freedomforceinternational.org and, as they used to say, read all about it. And we will have to have you back on again to talk more about that because in further reading on your uh, site, uh, you talked about the difference between a pyramidal organization that's subject to basically a decapitation strike or coercion and, and bribery to, to be dissuaded from its course or dislodged from its course versus a holographic, uh, multidimensional organization which isn't leaderless, but it's leaderful, where ev every individual in it understands and embodies the vision that is able to recreate the organization, and therefore it's uh, surprisingly resilient. And uh, we'd love to have you back to talk more about that. And just thank you for joining us here on, on Reluctant Preppers. Okay. Well, I'm, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that. And I'm really delighted to know that you've been on our site and uh, you've absorbed that information and especially that you see the wisdom of it. It will work because we know it has already worked for our opponents. Well, G. Edward Griffin, renowned author of the Creature from Jekyll Island, another look at the Federal Reserve, thank you once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. All right, thank you, and goodbye.